Women and Power by Mary Beard, second part, a manifesto, read by Beatriz Acevedo. It takes only a casual glance at the modern Western traditions of speech making, at least up to the 20th century, to see that many of the classical themes that I have been highlighting emerge time and time again. Women who claim a public voice get treated as freakish androgynes like Maesia, who defended herself in the forum, or they apparently treat themselves as such. The obvious case is Elizabeth I's belligerent address to the troops at Tilbury in 1588 in the face of the Spanish Armada. In the words, many of us learned at the school, she seems posit positively to abo to abow her own andro androgyny. I know I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and the stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. An odd slogan to get young girls to learn. The truth is that she probably never said anything of the sort. There is no script from her hand or that of her speechwriter, no eyewitnesses account, and the canonical version comes from the letter of an unreliable commentator with his own axe to grind, written almost 40 years later. But for my purpose, the probably fictionality of the speech makes it even better. The nice twist is that the male letter writer puts the boast or confession of androgyny into Elizabeth's own mouth. Looking at modern tradition of oratory more generally, we also find the same areas of license for women to talk publicly, whether in support of their own sexual interests or to parade their victimhood. If you search out the women's contributions included in those curious compedia called the 100 Greatest Speeches in History and the like, you'll find that the most of the female highlights from Emily Pankhurst to Hillary Clinton's address to the UN Conference on Women in Beijing are about the lot of women. So too, is probably the most popularized anthologized example of female oratory of all, the 1851 Ain't I a Woman, a speech of Sojourner Truth, a slave abolitionist and American campaigner for women's rights, and ain't I a woman she is to supposed to have said. I have borne 13 children and seized them all sold, sold to slavery, and when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me, and ain't I a woman. I should say that influential as these words may have been, they are only slightly less mythical than Elizabeth's as Tilbury. The authorized version was written up a decade or so after Sojourner Truth said whatever she said. That is when the now famous refrain, which she certainly did not say, was inserted, while at the same time her words as a whole were translated into a southern drawl to match the abolitionist message even though she came from the north and had been brought up speaking Dutch. I'm not saying that women's voices raised in support of women's causes were not or are not important. Someone has to speak up for women. But it remains the case that women's public speech has for centuries been niched into that area. Even that license has not always been or consistently been available to women. There are countless examples of attempts to write women entirely out of the public discourse, Telemachus style. A notorious recent case was the silencing of Elizabeth Warren in the U.S. Senate and her exclusion from the debate when she attempted to read out a letter by Coretta Scott King. Few of us, I suspect, know enough about the rules of senatorial debate to know how justified this was formally. But those rules did not stop Bernie Sanders and other senators, admittedly in her support, reading out exactly the same letter and not being excluded. But there are unsettling literary examples too. One of the main themes of Henry James Bostonians, published in the 19th 1880s is the silencing of Virina Tarrant, a young feminist campaigner and speaker. 
as she drops clo closer to her suitor, Basil Ransom, a man in doubt as James stresses with the rich, deep voice, she finds herself increasingly unable to speak, as she once did, in public. Ransom effectively reprivatizes her voice, insisting that she speak only to him. Keep your soothing words for me, he says. In the novel, James' own standpoint is hard to pin down. Certainly readers have not warmed to Ransom, but in his essays, James make it clear where he stood. For he wrote about the polluting, contagious, and socially destructive effect of women's voices, in voice that could easily have come from the pen of some second century AD Roman, and were almost certainly in part derived from classical sources. On their American women's influence, he insisted, language risks becoming a generalized mumble or jumble, a tongueless lover or a snarl or whine. It will sound like the moo of the cow, the bray of the ass, and the bark of the dog. Note the echo of the tongueless philomela, the moo of Io, and the barking of the female orator in the Roman Forum. James was one among many. In what amounted to a crusade at the time for proper standards in American speech, other prominent contemporaries praised the sweet domestic singing of the female voice, while entirely opposing its use in the wider world. And there was plenty of thundering about the thin nasal tones of women's public speech, about their twangs, wifles, snuffles, whines, and whinies. In the names of our homes, our children, of our future, of our national honor, James said again, don't let us have women like that. Of course, we don't talk in those bold terms now, or not quite. For many aspects of this traditional package of views about the unsuitable of women for public speaking in general, a package going back in its essentials, it is essential so over two my, millennia, millennia, mil, millennia, mm. still underlies some of our own assumptions about the awkwardness with the female voice in public. Take the language we still use to describe the sound of women's speech, which is not at all far from James or those pontificating Romans. In making a public case, in fighting their corner, in speaking out, what are women said to be? strident? They whine and they whine? After one particular vile bout of internet comments on my own genitalia, are tweeted, are tweeted rather pluckily, I thought, that it was all a bit gobsmacking. This was reported by one commentator in a mainstream British magazine in these terms. The misogyny is truly gobsmacking. She whined. So far as I can see from a quick Google troll, the only other group in this country said to whine as much as women are, un are unpopular premiership football managers on a losing streak. Do those words matter? Of course they do, because they underpin an idiom that acts to remove the authority, the force, even the humor from what women have to say. It is an idiom that effectively repositions women back into the domestic sphere. People winch over things like the washing up. It trivializes their words or it reprivatizes them. Contrast to the deep voice man with all the connotations of profundity that the simple word deep brings, it is still the case that when we, when listeners hear a female voice, they do not hear a voice that connotes authority, or rather they have not learned how to hear authority in it. They don't hear muscles. And it is not just voice. You can add in the craggy or wrinkled faces that signal mature wisdom in the case of, in the case of a bloke, but past my use by date in the case of a woman. They do not tend to hear a voice of expertise either, at least not outside the traditional spheres of women's sexual interests. For a female MP to be Minister of Women or Education or Health is very different is a very different thing from being Chancellor of the 
exchequer, a post which no women in the United Kingdom has yet filled. And across the board, we see we still see tremendous resistance to the female encroachment onto traditional male discursive territory. Whether it's the abuse heard at Jackie Oatley for having the nerve to stray from the netball court to become the first women commentator on match of the day, or what can be meted out to women who appear on Question Time, where the range of topics discussed is usually fairly mainstream male political. It might not be a surprise that the same commentator who accused me of whining claims to run a small, light-hearted competition for the most stupid women to appear on Question Time. More interesting is another cultural connection this reveals, that unpopular, controversial, or just plain different views when voiced by a woman are taken as indications of her stupidity. It is not that you disagree, it is that she is stupid. Sorry, love, you just don't understand. I've lost count of the number of times I've been called an ignorant moron. These attitudes, assumptions, and prejudices are hardwired into us. These attitudes, assumptions, and prejudices are hardwired into us, not into our brains. There is no neurological reason for us to hear low-pitched voices as more authoritative than high-pitched ones, but into our culture, our language, and millennia of our history. And when we, th well, and when we are thinking about the underrepresentation under of women in national politics, the relative muteness in the public sphere, we have to think beyond what some prominent British politicians and their chums got up to in the Oxford Bollingdon Club, beyond the bad behavior and blockish culture of Westminster, beyond even family-friendly hours and childcare provision, important as those are. We have to focus on the even more fundamental issues of how we have learned to hear the contributions of women or going back to that punch cartoon for a moment on what I like to call the mistrix questions. Not just how does she get the word in the edge ways, but how can we make ourselves more aware about the processes and prejudices that make us not listen to her. <laughs> 